From Chicago's Can TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there, and welcome to Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Um, last week at this time, we had what I would call a pretty extraordinary conversation with Lori Lightfoot, who is the chair of the Chicago Police Board, and uh, who was talking with us about a number of issues with the police. And then we kind of got off into a larger conversation about how it's not just the police, it's everything is everything, which is a favorite topic of mine here on the show. And we decided that uh, since we had too much show for last week, that we would split it up and do two shows out of it. So today, we're going to just pick up that conversation where we left off last week. And remember, you can see both of these shows by going to this address at any time, watching them on demand. And uh, we thank you very much for watching. So here is part two of our conversation with Lori Lightfoot about policing, training, flaws in the SSL, and everything else. Here it is. A couple of articles have come out in the last few weeks month or so, sometimes in Chicago Magazine, about the SSL, the mm -hmm. Strategic Subject List. Mm -hmm. We were originally led to believe that there were about 1,400 people on the list, but when the Sun-Times got uh, actually, you know, had to file a lawsuit but was given access to it, they discovered that there are <laughs> 398,000 entries on this thing. I don't know how many people that is, but it's a lot more than... 1400 mm -hmm. and it encompasses everyone who's been arrested and fingerprinted in Chicago since 2013 and one of the many criticisms of this list is that it was well it's not exactly clear why we set it up in the first place but apparently it was to try to help find people who could be victims of crime and and help relieve them of that mm -hmm. But now we're finding that, you know, there are, that doesn't seem to be the numbers. And, and we're looking at 56% uh, of the people between 20 and 29 who are African American, who are male, who are Chicagoans, 56% are on this list. Is this, is this good policing? Is this what we need? I mean, we don't even know what this list is. There's no transparency. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be some big algorithm running in the background, like on Facebook or something. Well, let's, let's, let's deconstruct this a little bit. In the time that we are in, where there is mistrust of the police department is so high, having, having a list around which there's no transparency doesn't help at all to, to, I would to, think to state the obvious. Yeah. It, 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 it engenders a lot of mistrust and a lot of conspiracy theories about what it is. Mm -hmm. Now obviously a list that has, what, what did you say, 35,000 entries on it, something to that effect? No, 398,000 yeah. entries. Well, that's not a useful list, ten, clearly. Ten times that number. Yeah, yeah. that's not a useful list, clearly. No. So No, it's not, because um, it is, as I said, a list of everyone who's been arrested and fingerprinted in Chicago. That's not helpful, um, and I think that um, th there are clearly limitations to the value of something like that that has, you know, literally everybody who's been uh, arrested or picked up or had a contact card from the south or the west sides, and, and I'm making it up a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, law enforcement, any responsible law enforcement, at, uh, and particularly a large urban police department like Chicago, but also true of the federal agencies, they clearly collect data on folks that they believe are of concern. There are different ways in which that information is collected, and frankly, to some extent, I don't think that every nuance of that information should be public because there's a reason you collect it. You're collecting it to make sure that you have an accurate accounting of folks who are dangerous to the community. And mm -hmm. there are people in Chicago, obviously, that are bad folks oh, and, yeah. that, and that want to do us harm, um, whether it's at the street gang level or whether, frankly, it's folks who have larger ambitions for themselves um, that, are, um, that need to be watched. But having said that, you can't get out there and constantly talk about the strategic subject list without people wanting to know more about it, what without people wanting to say, what is this, and am speak? I on it? How yeah. do I get on it? Right. What's the criteria? Yeah. So it's yeah. like the, it's, it's a little like the um, do not fly list where mm -hmm. we had five-year-olds on the list because they had a similar name and maybe we're in the same town as somebody who was really a problematic character and shouldn't get mm -hmm. on a plane. Managing the communications around 
what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it is critically important. And with due respect to the police department, I think they laid a big egg when it came to this list. I think what is actually happening is something different. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of use now of technology and data. Social networks are coming into play. Now, I read the Chicago Ma Magazine article, and I think they conflated the SSL with the work that Chris Millett is doing, um, who's um, tied to, to John Jay. But let me just say this, um, and if you're really interested in this topic, Andrew Papacristo, who is a <laughs> uh, sociologist at Yale, used to be at U of C, lived in Chicago for a long time, knows the Chicago scene, is really doing some interesting, I think, smart things around social networks. And I would urge the police department to really tap into Andrew's work because he makes a very compelling case that the company you keep, and that's really the essence of mm -hmm. um, his work, matters. It matters in whether you're going to be a victim. It also matters in whether you're likely to be somebody to pick up a gun and be a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And being smarter about the technology and the data that's out there is something we want the police department to do. Right. We want them to be strategic in the way that they use data and information. But a list that has almost 400,000 people's names on it, I can't see how that could possibly be useful, particularly when the police department doesn't own the algorithm. That's a algorithm that's Which is a proprietary, that's a whole other right. issue, right. proprietary to this professor at UIC. But I think the messaging and the communication around this um, has really put them in a, a near impossible um, situation. But I think the reality on the ground, my sense is, is actually something different. Clearly, if somebody's name, they pull somebody's name out of a hat from this uh, you know, 400,000 person list and go to Kim Fox and say, hey, we put this person on the list, go and prosecute them. Um, she's going to say, yeah, n no chance that that's happening. Mm -hmm. There are still things like probable cause. Right, the Fourth right. Amendment, the Fifth Amendment still matters. Well, I mean, as a, as a constitutionalist, I, I, this, is, uh, this is one of the questions that I have for you about this. Is, uh, you know, Yana's article points out that the SSL is being used to trigger arrests because a name is on that list. But the person's name... I'm not sure that that's correct. Is that, what's, did did what's, I misinterpret what, that? No, no, I think that's what she wrote, but I think what's, here's what's happening, my sense. You still have to have probable cause for an arrest. The fact that, and I'm going to focus on social networking, in, in, you know, what's happening now, for example, if there's a shooting, there's a significant amount of energy around who is the shooter, who is mm -hmm. his social network, who's mm -hmm. his buddies, who's this, who's that, to, to figure out, is there going to be retaliation? to figure out who's likely to also pick up arms associated with the person. And by the way, y your buddy got shot, you now, the mm -hmm. and we know this from the data, mm -hmm. that you are now at a heightened risk of being a victim of crime as well. Mm -hmm. So being smart about that, I think, is something that we want There's the police department. There's some benefit to There absolutely to is some benefit to that. Mm -hmm. But I th what I think has happened is there's SSL. SSL's been, been talking talked about, and then an arrest is made based on normal constitutional policing, and then a communication comes out and said, well, we knew it because he was on our list. So there's a conflation of, right. in making connections between policing, le le legitimate policing based upon probable cause and evidence, and the fact that somebody happens to be on this list when the connection really is pretty per, um, peripheral. I, I, I want to know if you're troubled because I am, but I'm an uninformed individual. I'm bothered by the fact that this list is scooping up all this data about people who were merely arrested, that were never, uh, were never convicted of anything. So you could be someone who just, you know, you were arrested suspicion of you know, an ounce of pot or something, and it never went to court, and that's the only thing you have. But it has you on that. It has you on that list. It's like we aren't we trying to get away from from stigmatizing people. Well, for... uh, certainly we don't want to be stigmatizing people. That that goes without saying. Um, but the more troubling aspect of um, a a collection of information on unknown or dubious um, subjective specification is what is done with it, mm -hmm. right? How is it used? 
if we had a situation where people were getting arrested merely because they had previously been arrested, mm -hmm. merely because they had an association with somebody else who was a bad actor, then yeah, we should all absolutely be up in arms and fighting that. And, and frankly, I think we have a very aggressive civil rights bar here in the city, mm -hmm. ACLU and others, we've been rushing into court to demand that that stop. I don't know and I don't believe that that's been happening. Clearly, if it was, I'd be one of the first people saying that practice has to stop immediately. Okay. Well, that but I think, I think both because there hasn't been careful language and messaging around that list and that there's been this linkage of we arrested John and he was on our list, so the SSL list works. Mm -hmm. They're connecting things that don't necessarily that are, are, con yeah. are connected, yeah. and that's a problem. We have just a couple of minutes left. Can we do a lightning round? Sure. A couple of things. I, actually, I wanted to talk to you in much greater length about a bunch of things, but uh, Campbell versus the City of Chicago, which is the big uh, civil rights case that was brought against the City of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Lots of people all around the country. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal case. The city of Chicago went to court on Monday mm -hmm. and uh, sought to uh, have that case dismissed. Right. And the our argument was that um, the uh, extensive ongoing reform efforts uh, in the in the Chicago Police Department make the case makes the case moot essentially. Mm -hmm. Your reaction to that? Well, I don't want to comment about pending and ongoing litigation. But our, I think our discussion today, particularly about what needs to be done to continue the reform effort, demonstrates that there is much, much more work to be done. And, and that's what I'll say about that. I'll try one other little bite at the apple here. Mm -hmm. If the mayor had called you and said, hey, we're thinking about uh, filing this suit to drop this, would you have recommended that it go forward? Well, it's not for me to, to make that kind of judgment, and I'd obviously have to know a lot more information. The motion to dismiss, which I've read, has a, a number of different elements to it, um, one of which is standing whether or not this particular group of plaintiffs is, are the proper plaintiffs to be able to bring these claims. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I think stepping back from this particular lawsuit, there's a continuing um, sentiment that is deep and widespread, particularly in communities of color here in the city, that our police department is failing those same communities that our police department um, is continuing in practices that are abusive, um, that violate constitutional rights. Now, whether that perception is real or not, and I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the problems continue, the perception is real and deep and hard felt. We saw that um, in a number of different ways through the task force process. And quite apart from litigation, the police department has to reckon with that perception and that reality because it cannot effectively do its core mission of keeping us safe if people don't regard it as legitimate mm -hmm. for whatever reason. That the is a that of the is government. the consent of the government. Mm -hmm. It is a significant problem. I know the superintendent from day one recognized that, has been going out into the communities. I mean, if you haven't witnessed him in communities, it's pretty, something remarkable to behold. He's incredibly charismatic. Mm -hmm. People who will stand up at our police board meetings and give it to him with both barrels yeah. oh, will go, seen will go yeah. afterwards yeah. and take selfies with him. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's a, he's a pretty impressive guy when it yeah. comes to engaging with the public. But the superintendent alone cannot do that. That has to be something that is understood and valued, mm -hmm. and valued by every member of the department, yeah. particularly those that interact with the public. 6,000 illegal guns were picked up off the street. So far. So far this mm -hmm. year. That's more than in the past. Mm -hmm. I can't help but feel like that is, I, I, I just kind of get a feeling like I just kind of shrug my shoulders. It's like, well, I don't know how, I, I imagine that there are hundreds of thousands of illegal guns on the streets. And the real problem is that, you know, if they wanted to send in the feds, they should send them into Indiana to stop them coming over here or Wisconsin. Very true. But, but I don't know, is it, is, that, is it an important number? I think it is an important number for a host of reasons. Uh, you know, there's a debate going on right now as to whether or not the police are actually policing. Mm -hmm. whether or not the, or because arrests are down, investigatory stops are down, and obviously the violence continues to um, escalate. Mm -hmm. So there are some who would say the police aren't doing their job. Uh, unfortunately, I think arrests and investigatory stops are, are very imprecise 
um, metric to determine what's really going on out there with police. Because last year it was close to 9,000 guns, that, illegal guns that were taken off the street at a time when arrests were way down, investigatory stops were way down. You can't get illegal guns without engaging in yeah. police activity. Yeah. So something's happening out there. And uh, the superintendent That's says well, we're, we're being smarter, we're really focusing on um, our energies on resources um, and, and, and people and, and activities that are really um, threatening the community and we're being smarter about it. Perhaps that's so. Well, I guess the parallel question to that is that your eyebrows get raised when you see that arrests are down 24%. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, I presume there's a, there's a kind of a good news side to that number I, too? I, th I think so. Look, this started, um, and my friends at the ACLU will uh, be unhappy about me saying this, but this started, this downward trend, when there was a focus brought by the ACLU on, on stop, and st stop and frisk, mm -hmm. and they imposed a new uh, investigatory stop form. It used to be called a contact card, and it was yeah. literally that. It was like a yeah. three by five index card, and you'd scribble some information down on a person that you stopped. But what we were finding, frankly, particularly in 2014, is the number of stops of black and brown youth and uh, all across the city was so grossly disproportionate to um, the, frankly, what they were finding in terms of contraband, and uh, that it was a problem, and it's a problem that remain that lingers, and mm -hmm. frankly, I think is going to linger for a long time because too many folks of color, no matter where they were in the city, felt like they had did not have freedom of movement, that they didn't own the geography under their feet, that no matter their age, yeah. gender, the activity, that they were going to be um, improperly stopped. I remember you mentioned that last time you were on the show. It's yeah. like you know you have you have middle-class people in Chatham who are just suddenly being stopped by the police right. for, for no reason other than that they have to fill out a contact card. And, it, and, it, and, and I think part of the problem was the overemphasis on stops yeah. was not well thought out, yeah. was not properly communicated to the people on the street. I mean, I heard from officers complaining mm -hmm. about all they care about is contact cards. Mm -hmm. They don't really care about policing. It wasn't explained, and it wasn't explained in a way that would make the, the activity actually constitutional. Luckily, I think we're a ways away from those days where the stops were through the roof for no good reason. Um, but there clearly, there's clearly uh, more work that needs to be done. This, this notion of, um, and, and this feeds, I think, that you, you mentioned the, the 6,000 um, guns. What it also says, as you alluded to, is we ha still have a problem with our neighbors, Indiana, yeah. Wisconsin, and yeah. Michigan. Yeah. If you, the, I think hopefully late, sometime later this year, the ATF will put out another report. They call it their gun trace report. Um, hopefully CPD also will put out its own version of that. But what we saw from the last report that I think came out in 2014, 2015, the vast majority of these legal guns are coming from Indiana. There's a mm -hmm. huge number. And they're coming from southern states that have lax gun laws. Um, I think we should build a wall. <laughs> maybe we should build a fortress around yeah. our city. But we, what it also, I think, tells us is we need to be smarter and, frankly, tougher about enforcing gun laws, particularly um, around um, felons who have repeatedly picked up illegal guns. I mean, it is a real problem. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it should not be that a kid can get access to an illegal gun easier than a, a, a pack of cigarettes or a bottle of beer. And that's what's the reality in too many of our neighborhoods in the city. Yeah. Um, the, as you say, the, the, you, you mentioned stop and frisk. I, I don't even know exactly what stop and frisk is. It, everybody has their own version, their own mm -hmm. view of what it is. Are we not doing it anymore? Have we stopped? Oh, I think there's some of it still going on. I don't. I don't mean to suggest. I mean, that, is it? Well, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that as though it's just. It's an alti I don't know. Is it, I mean, in, I think in what certain we need, circumstances, it's I think what a good we need thing. to do, and this is this is going to be part of the training, and it needs to be part of the training, mm -hmm. particularly for veteran officers. Mm -hmm. um, reasonable suspicion, which is the the, the basis for a, what's called the Terry stop, isn't. I just didn't like the way you looked. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the way, I didn't like who you were. Mm -hmm. I didn't like where you were standing. Mm -hmm. Reasonable suspicion means you have reasonable suspicion that to believe that this person has committed a crime, like right now, like mm. not five days ago, mm. um, unless you, this is a person that um, uh, matches the description of somebody that, yeah. that's yeah. wanted. Yeah. And, and we need to do a much better job, a much better job of training officers around what that means and what the, yeah. what the, 
what the, what the scope of that Terry Stop authority is and what the limitations of that are. While we have you, I, I just, since we're, you know, we've expanded the show into two, into two weeks here, I think you're a pretty thoughtful person, and, I, and I've really wondered how you feel about the everything is everything um, aspect of life here, because, you know, we're, we're depending on when you view this show, uh, we have been engaged in this huge battle over funding of the schools, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, resulted in all kinds of secondary battles, and maybe by the time you see this, it's been resolved. But it's really hard to have this conversation that we've just had for the last now two shows without having that conversation knitted In into the schools yeah. and, and into all of the other social right. contracts that we make. Mm -hmm. No, I think, that's, I think that's absolutely right. Let me, let me approach it from a couple different angles. Police officers walk into circumstances where they are confronted with, frankly, our failings. Yeah. We have, because of the budget impasse and other reasons, completely decimated the social safety net that is critically important to the quality of life for way too many of our citizens. And I say way too many because we need to be moving folks into meaningful work. We need to have an economy that works for them. We need to give them skills so that they can actually be part of that community, that economy. Mm -hmm. But given the circumstances where we have neighborhoods that are high crime and 50% un unemployment, where way too many kids in that neighborhood live in poverty, where the um, social safety net has been completely shredded, where they don't have basic community anchors um, like good schools, like um, good parks, mm -hmm. like community centers, um, daycare, uh, movie theaters, grocery stores, drug stores, things that most of us take for granted do not exist in huge swaths mm -hmm. of the south and west sides of the city. And it's exactly those neighborhoods where crime festers, where shootings are commonplace, where people do not feel safe. So we really want to talk about how we make a significant difference in violence and how we can um, uh, make sure that we have a fully functioning police department that is up to capacity, that is policing in a constitutional way. We also have to talk about all those other factors as well. We also, I think, have to think about this discussion in the context of what we see really being played out nationally and not just here in Chicago. People feel like government doesn't matter, that it is irrelevant to their life, or worse, that government and elected officials and the collection of tax dollars is part of the problem, that, is, that the government and elected officials are actually doing harm to them. We've talked before about the consent of the governed. The consent of the governed is fraying in so many ways that clearly affect policing, but really, ref uh, I think, are, we are dangerously close to reaching a point of chaos in our democracy because people have to have confidence that when mm -hmm. we take their tax dollars, when we elect people to office, that they're actually going to do their job in the public interest. And there are too many daily reminders to folks that are just trying to get through the day and live their life that the government doesn't care about them. And that is a problem. And that is a problem when you think about, in the context of policing, who is the government actor that is most present in people's lives? Let me guess, um, the police. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if we're going to talk about these issues, we have to talk about the others as well. Mm -hmm. it, it all is part of a complicated but interconnected narrative. And to address these things, we can't do it piecemeal. We have to talk about it in a comprehensive yeah. way. Now, it doesn't mean that we, we ought to throw up our hands in dismay because it's too complicated to climb this mountain that we've created. And, it, and we shouldn't wait 
until we have everything perfected before we can move forward. But there has to be a recognition of the interconnectedness to all these different pieces. Yeah. I, I was talking a few weeks ago to a police officer on, in, in a different context, and he told me that he often is assigned um, into Englewood, mm -hmm. especially on weekends. And I thought it was really interesting that he said, you know what really grabs me the most about it is you'll drive down a corner and you'll park on the corner and there's like, could be as many as a hundred kids on that block just standing around. They mm -hmm. got nothing to do. They got mm -hmm. no place to go. Mm -hmm. and, and here I am, I'm a, I'm a cop, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to keep order, but there's, there's, there is no order there. Right. You know, it, it was, it's, it was a really poignant kind of moment. To yeah, it's, a, it's the absence of those community anchors yeah. that we were just yeah. talking about. It, it is, is a problem that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Our elected officials, frankly, I think, have let us down. We are, frankly, business community, I think, has let us down. We have to all come together to help solve this problem. This isn't just something that the people in those neighborhoods, too bad for them, sorry that it's dangerous, sorry it's violent. It, it affects all of us, and we pay for it one way or the other. We pay for it by having generations of kids with the lights gone out in them, that they don't feel connected, so, and that they get lured into things that are, are dangerous for them. Is, it, is this a problem with, I mean, I, I, I don't even know where to begin to focus on this, but is it a problem with city government? Do we, do we not um, prioritize the money that we have properly, or do we just not have enough money to do the things we need to do? I think it's a bigger, bigger challenge than that. I mean, certainly I think that the city government has a role to play. The state government has a role to play. Yeah, I'll see. I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's not a coincidence that our violence started escalating at the very same time that the social service agencies who were in those neighborhoods doing the Lord's work, that the spigot got turned off. Hmm. There was a budget impasse. The, the money either went away entirely or it got substantially reduced so that early childhood education, daycare, work with ex-offenders, work with the uh, mentally challenged, all of that work that was happening quietly in those neighborhoods. Now, people didn't call it violence prevention, but that's effectively what it was. Mm -hmm. And when those social service agencies had to substantially pare back their offerings or disappear completely from those neighborhoods, what happened? Now, that's not enough, and I said this before, we shouldn't rest and think, well, as if we just fully fund the social services agencies, we've done our job. No. We want to have those neighborhoods standing up mm -hmm. and be strong economically like any other neighborhood in Chicago. We, can't, we shouldn't rest until that happens. And it's not just the role of government. The business community has a role to play. Not-for-profits and foundations mm -hmm. also have a role to play. But what I hear all over and over again is like, how can I help? How do I get connected? We need a comprehensive plan to allow people from different perspectives to be able to plug in to help. This is an incredibly sensitive question to ask, but have we kind of lost a generation or two of, of black Chicago? I worry about it. I absolutely worry about it. We have, we have kids that, um, you know, from an early age, I was thinking about this recently, I saw um, two young black kids who were downtown and they were being led across the street by their, their parent and they were overjoyed. I mean, they, they just, you could see it. They were having the time of their life, mm -hmm. smiling, they were walking, they were so bound with energy that they started skipping. And then I see kids when I, I'm out in the community on the south and the west side not that much older than those kids, and you and you you look at them, and it feels like the light has gone out. That nobody loves them. That people don't care about them. I think as a society and as a community, we have an obligation to every child, um, and we have an obligation to do everything that we can to provide them with the support that they need to be contributing members of our community and our economy. And if we are not doing that, when we have 30, 40, 50 percent unemployment in a lot of these neighborhoods, we have failed. We have failed. And we, it's not too late. It's never too late. But we need to really dig down deep. That conversation isn't happening nearly enough among the elected class. Mm -hmm. It's happening 
in the neighborhoods, it's happening in the faith community, it's happening in the not-for-profit community, but we all need to come together as a community and face that challenge head on. And, and you asked me before, well, is this a, something for the city government? Yes, of course. But it's for everybody mm -hmm. who cares about a strong and vibrant Chicago, not just downtown, not just on the north side, but everywhere. Do you think, a, do you think some kind of a really um, massive jobs program of some kind, uh, something unlike anything we've seen before, uh, could be created, that the money could be found for it, that yes. you could just artificially uh, hire people to just do all the no, work we need I don't, to do? I don't think artificially hire. Well, I, I guess think, that's the wrong right? word. But, 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 but we are spending directively. hundreds of millions of dollars in the criminal justice system every single year. The money is mm -hmm. there. It's just what's our priority and what we're our values. We're spending it to inc incarcerate people. Yeah, we're spending it to incarcerate people instead of educating them. Yeah. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, that a fraction of the amount of money that we spend on an individual basis to incarcerate people, if we put that money into educating them, providing them with job skills, we would have tremendous savings in tax dollars. Not to mention we'd have much better schools. We'd have, we'd we'd have, have a better school we'd system. We'd be giving people a better life. We'd yeah. be helping them. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, um, not talk about personal responsibility, mm -hmm. but in the circumstances that a lot of these kids find themselves in, we can't talk about bootstraps. They no, don't even have boots. no, it's not a bootstraps issue at all. Right? No, it's 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 creating an entirely different platform uh, on which to stand, and it's a uh, it's a very complicated issue. I mean, some people have put you know there have been some reports lately people offering up prices of, you know, two billion dollars or something, that if mm -hmm. you could find two billion dollars, you might be able to create a fuller employment picture or something. I don't know. I, I, I just find myself getting very despairing about where we're at. And, well, I, and I, uh, I understand that. And, and, it's, and, and sometimes it's hard not to feel that way. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to Think about those kids that I was describing before. Yeah. And it's think not about just their the, kids. It's, it, no, it's no, their parents not. and they're their grandparents. Absolutely, absolutely right. But, but my point is simply that if we reach people mm -hmm. early, then they are going to have a much better chance of having a good life. And certainly, we will diminish the huge number of folks who are you know, by the time they're in their teens or early 20s mm -hmm. on a completely different trajectory that is going to lead to either soon death soon or it's going to lead to a life of misery. Um, and, I, and I think we have to have a real conversation and reckoning around those, those concepts because it is playing itself out every single day mm -hmm. in our city and it is, a, it, is, it is another manifestation of significant problems, not the least of which is violence. Mm -hmm. So, are, are you interested in doing more of this kind of work? I mean, you, you're you're a you're an incredibly articulate person. You can hold a platform. You can talk about things. Are you interested in? I, I, trust me, I'm not trying to trick you here. Are you interested in politics? I'm interested in policy. Yeah, I'm interested in getting something done. You know, I I I come from very humble beginnings, mm -hmm. and I have been extremely fortunate and blessed in my life. And you know the, the 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 challenges that I describe those are challenges for people in my family. Mm -hmm. um, so I I know this stuff very well and I feel it um, deeply. I mm -hmm. have a brother who's spent most of his adult life incarcerated. Oh, really? He's now a sixty-something-year-old man struggling wow. every single day to try to find a job that doesn't you know uh, require him to do physical labor like he's a twenty-year-old. Yeah. So I get these issues. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, given that I've been so fortunate, that I, that I have an obligation to try to help. And that gives you some measure of optimism then, apparently. It does, because I can see when, when, you, when you do little things even, mm -hmm. it can make a huge difference in people's lives. Mm. There was a fascinating piece the other day on WBEZ. I think Becky Beebe did a piece about a guy who's a, I th I, I'm going to mangle this, but I think he's a teacher or something, and he managed to get some money 
to hire some of the kids in the school to fix the auditorium mm -hmm. because the auditorium wasn't mm -hmm. usable. And this was 10 years ago or something and now he's built it up into something much bigger and mm -hmm. he's got a bunch of kids working for him and they're trying to see, the mayor's trying to see if he can find money to do it year round. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the point to all of this is that um, we all remember getting our first job mm -hmm. and what a, what a a rite of passage that mm -hmm. was in our lives and this feeling that whoa I guess I'm I'm becoming an adult now I, you know, I'm gonna get a paycheck or something and that's one of the things that is so missing in so many the thousands hundreds of thousands of lives well there there are there are efforts being made but they need to be scaled up I'm gonna give yeah. a plug to yeah. <clears throat> the Crystal Ray Network mm -hmm. Crystal Ray started in Pilsen 15 years ago maybe longer 20 years ago and the concept was we were going to give a college prep education to kids um, in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And one of the social compacts that the kids and their families had to make with the school is that they would help pay for the cost of their education by doing um, a job share. So oh. Oh. five kids have a job, each of them goes on a different day, and organizations across the city hire these kids. Mm. Um, now we've got uh, Crystal Ray here in Chicago, and we've got Christ the King on the west side. But they, the school spends a significant amount of, of resources helping training these kids, um, getting them not to be intimidated about going downtown and being in a, an office tower, mm -hmm. and then working a lot with the employers. I mean, if you talk to the kids that go through that, it's life-changing for I'm them. Sure. If we could yeah. take that model, yeah. and there's year up, which is um, you know, taking kids out of high school and, and putting them through a rigorous training program. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is we've got to have employers who are willing to um, provide opportunities for these kids, real jobs, not make work jobs, yeah. um, but real jobs that give them an opportunity to, be, to get the skills that they need to transform themselves. The kids have the right attitude, they have the right mi yeah. mindset, they're supported by uh, mentors from the schools and from the programs. We need employers to um, be all in and provide them with jobs. So at my firm, we've had Crystal Ray kids um, uh, uh, working there for years. They do, you know, back office clerical stuff, but it's 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 a good it's thing a job. for them. It's a job. You get to ride the elevator job. and look out the window. Yeah, and, and you have yeah. you have to dress yeah. appropriately. You have yeah. to be and there on time. Right, right, and right. then those kids. The success rate for them is off the charts. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I've always heard, I don't know how true any of it is, but there's always been these stories of people who who live in, you know, the inner city of Chicago who've never been downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find that hard to believe. It's but absolutely it, true. It's, never seen the lake. Never been to the beach, never mm -hmm. never seen the lake, and it's only a mile <coughs> or two away. That's, that's it's unbelievable. It's tragic. Me. Yeah. That's what it is. Lori Lightfoot, I always enjoy so much having you here to it's talk to pleasure. you. It's, it's, it's just a great pleasure talking to you, and I think you really have a lot of things to say, and that's why, we, um, that's why we've done two shows with you here. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. No, thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Okay? I hope so. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. That's Lori Lightfoot. She is the, um, she's the uh, chair of the Chicago Police Board and uh, just a kind of a general thinker about a lot of important things. And you've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It is a service of Can TV. Uh, we're here all the time, and we will continue uh, after uh, the Labor Day holiday. We're get, that's going to be our, our seventh anniversary show. Ooh, whoopee, huh? Hey, see you next week. Remember, you can watch us anytime by going to this address and see all of our shows uh, right there on, uh, on whatever you call What do you call that thing? Uh, it's um, on demand. There it is. It's on demand. See you next week. Bye-bye.